Um, my name is Carolina Adler. I am the Executive Director of the Mountain Research Initiative, which is a participating organization of GEO. And uh, we are very much looking forward to this session where we showcase uh, not only what we do in relation to GEO Mountains, which is a GEO work program uh, initiative dealing with mountains uh, worldwide, um, but also to hear from many different examples, uh, projects that are funded by EU uh, uh, funding agencies that have an element of data and information pertaining to mountains associated with their work. And we're very much looking forward to connect not only with the experiences uh, that I had in those projects, um, but also to learn about what we can learn from their experiences to bring to this session and to the Eurogeo community as we gather um, insights to share in terms of our perspectives regarding the Geo post-2025 process. So we have a very specific task for today in relation to that. So this session is elevating mountains in the geo post-2025 strategy, lessons from EU-funded projects in mountain areas. And this session is co-chaired by myself, Carolina Adler, and also with my colleague, Elisa Palazzi from ESAC CNR, which is also a geo-participating organization who couldn't join us uh, this week. Um, so I'm here on my lonesome at the front, but nevertheless, uh, we very much look forward to this session. Thank you for joining us. Next slide, please. So what um, we are going through today, so I'm just giving just a few uh, general um, uh, introductions to this session and will be followed by a sequential uh, number of uh, speakers and presentations that will uh, touch upon different aspects of data and information needs uh, from across uh, different uh, European projects. Oh, thank you. I have the clicker myself here for control. And but we'll start the session first with an introduction from uh, my colleague, James Thornton from the Mountain Research Initiative Coordination Office, uh, who will first give us an introduction to geo mountains and what we are doing and how we contribute to the overall geo um, community in relation to mountain work. And let's see if, yep. Went too quickly. So just to give you some background, um, Geo Mountains is a, a geo initiative that uh, was proposed and adopted by the geo community back in 2016. We are the global network on observations and information in mountain environments. And uh, we seek to engage with the, um, and, and contribute with, with many of the goals that and objectives that not only Geo is um, mobilizing, but also uh, to implement the GeoPost 2020 strategy in a more practical and impactful way. And this is the reason why we are looking to connect with the lessons from the various projects that we'll be presenting shortly. So the specific goals for this session are threefold. On the one hand, to stock takes on progress made within Geo Mountains as we move towards the post 2025 process. The second is to showcase these various EU funded projects with a mountain specific focus and invite those reflections to help us build the case to ensure that mountains are also part of that work in the future. And third, to also collect ideas and suggestions and contributions for potentially a future position paper that Eurogeo might want to um, consider on the subject of sustained, mount, um, sustained data and information. Um, but also how that helps in the European um, uh, position, if you like, in the broader geo post-2025 post um, strategy. So this is in a, in a very general nutshell what we are hoping together. And there will be opportunities after each of the presentations for your own questions and comments, and I'll be collecting uh, a set of uh, key insights and highlights that we can then report back tomorrow at the plenary session for this session. So coming back to this, um, I would like to then invite 
my colleague James Thornton, who will present on monitoring data and information in mountain environments. James is joining us virtually um, from uh, Switzerland, and I'll be happy to give him the floor now if um, we can switch to his presentation. And James, can we, are you online? Can yes, we... I'm online, Carlina. Can you see my presentation and can you hear me clearly? We can hear you perfectly. Good to hear from you. And we'll just get your slides coming up. There they are. Thanks, James. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Carolina. A good afternoon, everybody. I apologize I can't be with you there in Bolzano, but greetings from sunny Bern. Um, the main objective of my presentation, this initial presentation in the session this afternoon, is to provide this stock take on some of the recent progress made by Geo Mountains since around 2020, so over the last two or three years or so, um, on a global basis. So much of our work has been focusing on those mountain regions around the world where the situation regarding uh, data and information is somewhat less favorable than, than in Europe and seeking which lessons we can um, learn also and hearing from, um, from the other presenters to see um, how we can apply some of the advancements which have been made in Europe to some of these other contexts around the world. So having done that, I'll then briefly reflect upon how Geo Mountains could potentially seek to position itself in the Geo um, post-2020 uh, work program. And finally, perhaps reflecting on how we could um, continue some of the very strong existing collaborations we have with um, partners in Europe and also how we could potentially develop new collaborations and, and, and to have further impact um, going forward, including with Eurogeo, of course, uh, both in the short to the, to the more medium term. So as Caroline has mentioned, Geo Mountains is the global network for observations and information in mountain environments. And we have three main objectives. The first is to increase the discoverability, accessibility, and usability of a very wide range of data and information pertaining to mountains globally. Secondly, we seek to combine these data, or to integrate them, and to apply them to address key uh, scientific, uh, practical, or policy-related questions or challenges. And more generally, thirdly, we seek to build and coordinate um, a very collaborative community which combines mountain researchers, but also practitioners and other decision makers um, in the very collegiate uh, fashion. So the figure on the right hand side just seeks to um, visually encapsulate our scope and aims. Essentially, we're trying to be a broker or a bridge between data providers on the one hand, data users on the other, um, and, and these local to global policy processes and uh, political decisions, which, which have to be made, of course, considering um, a very broad range of uh, themes or disciplines, and of course, uh, crucially, their interactions and feedback mechanisms, both biophysical and more socioeconomic, and doing this on a, on a global basis, as I've already mentioned. Um, and so in Europe, some of the partners with whom we work very closely are Eurac Research, um, the ELTA, which is the Integrated European Long-Term Ecosystem Critical Zone and Socioecological Research uh, Infrastructure, and also the Virtual Alpine Observatory, the VAO, alongside many others, uh, both individual scientists, their institutions, and other organizations. So we feel very fortunate to, um, to include um, such, such institutions and individuals in our network. Um, I'll move on. Um, now to give a few examples of what we've been doing uh, of late with regards to that first objective, which is really our primary task of trying to um, develop inventories of some of the data sets which exist and some of the other associated aspects um, related to, to mountain monitoring. And so starting actually with regards to in situ data, which of course is absolutely crucial for, for many applications in mountains, we can only do so much with remote sensing and other um, approaches. And in this regard, we have a situation whereby quite a considerable proportion of the monitoring which is undertaken, certainly on a global basis, uh, ground monitoring, 
across multiple disciplines is actually con conducted by the research community, universities and so forth, rather than by operational uh, government uh, or, or, or local agencies. And so in this context, we have rather a complex um, monitoring landscape, if you like, whereby there are many, many different organizations involved, all doing things perhaps slightly differently, measuring different variables, using different instruments, sharing the data via different portals. And as a result, it can be, we, we feel very, very difficult to get a, a comprehensive overview of this situation, simply who is measuring what, why, when, where, and how, and, and how can we get hold of the actual corresponding observations and do something useful with them. And some of the consequences of this situation could be that we end up duplicating um, in situ infrastructure. There could be a certain redundancy, which is, which is unnecessary, some inefficiencies, or equally we could have some potential collaborations which just go undeveloped because we simply don't know what um, our neighbors in, in a neighboring country or a neighboring institution are, are doing. And so in this context, um, Geo Mountains has released a global inventory of in situ uh, mountain observational infrastructure. We're currently on the second version, and we present this uh, alongside many other resources on the Geo Mountains website. In this case, in the form of a web map where you can zoom in and you see various stations um, resolve themselves. And uh, one can click on, on an individual station and obtain some metadata um, about that station, including the operating organization, which variables are being measured over which periods, using which protocols, um, and so forth. So in pink, we see our mountainous um, extent. Um, of course, there, there are various visual um, options here, but just zooming into, uh, for example, the Zugspitze in southern Germany, um, rather a well-known uh, mountainous region uh, in Europe, of course, um, we can see, for example, that there's the Schnefernhauser uh, Mountain Observatory Station there, and we can um, get some information and, and in this case, um, find a link to, the, to a different website, to an external website, enabling us to obtain some of those observations. So this is um, a little bit the, the concept here. And um, overall, um, as I've said, this, this aims to be rather comprehensive. Uh, the full data set is available for download. And at the moment, it contains over 50,000 individual stations or small networks, experimental catchments, and so forth. And in some ways, this, I think, um, challenges the notion that mountains are, are poorly observed in some ways or to some extent, um, because there's a hell of a lot of infrastructure um, in place, clearly. However, um, there's still a, a great deal of work to be done to um, ensure that we have full and comprehensive metadata for all of these sites, and also to ensure access to the corresponding um, observations themselves. If we could ensure that this is rather a comprehensive inventory, then there could be great scope for um, very impactful gap analysis, which would span multiple disciplines and include both the, the operational and the uh, more research-oriented observations. And so with this, um, I would invite anybody who is aware of such sites or is or is perhaps operating such a site to, to submit that information and include, uh, include it in our inventory. And um, to complement the in-situ inventory, uh, we have a general inventory, um, which seeks to essentially just um, tabulate and collate uh, gridded data sets, which could be, for example, um, model outputs relevant to mountain region, perhaps reanalysis products or remotely sensed uh, data, data sets, data portals, which contain uh, such information pertaining to mountains and also maybe useful software tools um, or services which are open source and which are freely usable for, by the community. And this simply just aims to improve the efficiency and discoverability uh, and access accessibility of some of these um, data sets. But of course, over the last couple of years, we've seen also um, kind of quite a growth of similar inventories, for example, catalogs of data sets which are accessible in Google Earth Engine and so forth. And nevertheless, this is a very mountain specific um, product. And again, if you would like to uh, ensure that your data are included in uh, the next release of, of this inventory, then please get in touch and, and we can ensure that um, those data are, are findable uh, through Geo Mountains as well as 
perhaps through an institutional repository or through a publication or so forth. So this is just available uh, as a kind of simple interactive table for the time being, again, with the URL to, um, to access those data and hopefully quickly filter and find what, what might be interesting for you to explore. Um, alongside this work, we've been um, we've managed to, to contribute a few peer-reviewed publications, both with a scientific focus. So, for example, seeking to establish which variables we should be trying to monitor as priorities, given our limited resources um, for scientific applications, um, or, for instance, trying to um, establish um, concepts for monitoring mountains in a rather comprehensive fashion, this so-called notion of mountain observatories, where we have these dedicated regions where we're conducting measurements of many different system components using multi-methods um, at different spatial scales and so forth. Um, but then also we've been um, trying to apply some of these data sets already. So for example, uh, assessing some of the climate, um, the elevational dependencies rather in, in climate change um, in, across the world's mountains, um, as well as having some, um, doing some very um, applied, much more applied research with policy uh, applications, uh, for instance, looking at the spatial and temporal patterns uh, in human population in mountains and how they've evolved over the recent past, and likewise trying to identify some major gaps in in situ climate station coverage, for example, in um, high mountain Asia, where we um, where we see very low station densities, but of course a very high um, importance in terms of what is going on in those regions, especially with regards to water provision um, and other aspects to adjacent downstream regions. Um, in addition to this uh, event, which we're attending today, um, really a central um, mode of working of ours is to to have, have workshops to bring various stakeholders together over a period of a day or two or three days to discuss in depth, to exchange um, ideas. And so this year already, we've already had several um, such workshops and we actually have um, two more to come at least. Um, next month, I will be in uh, with my colleagues in uh, Rwanda, in East Africa, and then in, in Kathmandu, in the Hindu Kush for, for similar workshops, but just to give you a flavor and of course, um, you know, these are open events in general, and um, anybody interested is very, very welcome to keep an eye on the Geomountains website and apply and join us and contribute your knowledge and expertise to some of these endeavors. Uh, thirdly, we are trying to also, where possible, translate some of the, the science um, into formats which are more suitable or digestible for policy and decision related applications. So an example here would be this policy brief, which we developed last year in the context of the International Year of Sustainable Mountain Development, which seeks to explain to a more lay reader where the or how the measurements are fundamentally made um, on the ground or where the data come from, which are then translated into metrics or indicators, which may appear on the desk of a decision maker or a policy maker so that they can hopefully uh, better appreciate some of the, the challenges, the limitations, and they can make appropriate interpretations of the data and hopefully therefore reliable decisions. And taking that a step further recently, we've developed and released the Mountains Uncovered series. Now this provides a set of quite high level fact booklets for 100 mountain ranges globally uh, to provide an overview of, of, of the current status of, of each mountain range, but also um, to allow some comparison. So we use, for example, common global data sets in this case to enable these comparisons between mountain ranges to be as fair as possible. And so just show you now a couple of figures taken um, from, from the, uh, the, the fact booklet of the European Alps. We see, for example, everything from the extents and classifications of protected areas to, to land cover, to um, snow covered area, as well as some more socioeconomic um, figures and, and tables and, and maps as well. And these are all freely available for do download via Zenodo. And um, we very much hope that they will encourage the development of improved data sets, that any gaps in existing data sets, which meant that maybe a particular theme is not so well covered at the moment, this can be addressed. And equally, there's a very 
um, high importance for complementary work at a much more local scale, of course, in mountains, much more targeted um, to address very specific uh, local challenges or applications. And in this case, of course, we lose that element of comparability, but it's really important that this work goes on in two parallel streams, that we have the consistent global data set for prioritization um, at a global level, for example, which mountain regions may be most vulnerable to, to climate change impact, where do we need to invest our resources proportionately, but also we address the much finer and more specific local challenges equally. Um, and in part, part to do this, we, we also showcase on our website, not only projects in which we are directly involved, but also projects from the broader community, which um, which really also align very much with our aims and our philosophies around open data. And of course, the philosophies of GEO as a whole around open data, open science, transparency, reproducibility, long-term monitoring, integrated monitoring, science policy uh, dialogues, and so forth. Um, and where possible, we try to provide capacity or education building resources and there's a couple of examples here including this nice um, educational program for school children developed primarily by some some of our colleagues in Canada um, on the topic of mountain sustainability um, and I understand that they've already had many um, learners have been through the course and have very much appreciated uh, appreciated it as well. So turning our attention a little bit in the final two slides to Geo Mountains post 2025, um, GEO recently released um, a, uh, a draft of the strategy, the post-2025 strategy, and there's a link uh, to that document at the bottom here. But one of the um, objectives uh, or goals in this strategy is to develop these multidisciplinary programs or nexus areas um, to, to really have to, to really elevate the, the impact of, of, of what is done within GEO. And given that mountains are rather natural integrators themselves, we have many, many different processes corresponding to lots of different disciplines all going on within a given region, spanning many spatial scales, including the upstream downstream connections. And of course, as well as the fact that mountains are globally distributed, it could be that um, Geo Mountains may potentially be in the position to, to either lead or to, to be one of the major contributors to a dedicated program or nexus on the topic of of mountains perhaps. And so I've just taken one quotation from this uh, general GEO report, um, which I think of course refers to GEO as a whole, but I think it also applies very much to GEO mountains. Uh, there is a clear need for a global partnership where data providers and users from all communities work together, uh, better coordination, greater inclusion, reduced duplication and fast action. So I think this, this could potentially apply very much in the case of, of, of GEO mountains. And I think um, in particular, um, given, as I said, that of course, whilst there is still um, work to be done in Europe regarding more systematic monitoring, better data management, um, data sharing and so forth, the situation really is extremely favorable compared to many other uh, key mountain regions around the world. And therefore the question is really, how can we transfer some of the learning and the knowledge um, and also technology, which we've developed in Europe over the past five or 10 years, uh, and make it available to our colleagues working in, in other mountain regions where the impacts of climate change or global change may be felt even more profoundly. And so taking another quotation from the strategy document, we should actively co-produce meaningful resources that address contemporary challenges. And of course, regarding mountains, we have many of them. And so certainly maybe the role of geo mountains could be again in, in bridging the gap um, this time um, as a sort of broker between um, yeah, the, all the advancements which are being made in North America and Europe and in other mountain regions and also helping um, to share those capacities um, with our colleagues working, working elsewhere and our regional, many regional and local partners in the different regions. Um, and so with this, I didn't want to take up too much further time, but just thank you very much indeed for your attention and um, happy to answer any questions now or to contribute uh, later to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. I very much appreciate the uh, message there that mountains are indeed an integrator and it's a very important message to bring forth.
in how we contribute to uh, implementing the post-2025 strategy. Although I must say that the enhanced knowledge transfer is a two-way uh, uh, process as well. Um, whatever we transmit and share from the European experience is also enriched by us seeking and connecting to the experiences had in other places around the world as well. Uh, we are just uh, as is important to also acknowledge that this is um, a shared capacity uh, process in that way. Thanks very much, James. Uh, are there any immediate questions for us to tackle at this point before we move on? Yes, please. And please introduce yourself as you raise your question. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. Um, my name is Sophie Justice. I represent the uh, European network of UNESCO Global Geoparks. Um, I was very interested by the presentation, um, particularly this notion of being an integrator of a lot of very different data. Um, particularly by the notion that there was um, uh, a selection of some essential variables. And it would be interesting to have just a, a very quick idea of, of what, where you have identified these uh, essential variables. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you very much indeed for the, for the question, Sophie. Um, indeed, we've been conducting some work over the past um, yeah, year or two, uh, perhaps a little bit longer, seeking to established the utility of these existing essential variables frameworks frameworks in mountains specifically. So are there any additional variables which are particularly relevant in mountains which are missing in terms of climate variables or central biodiversity variables, essential societal, societal and economic variables as well? Um, and also, I think a key point is in mountains, some variables may be shared and may be more generally applicable. Um, but the question is, what attributes do these measurements need to have to be useful for general applications in mountains specifically. And so this often requires, for example, um, higher spatial resolution, for example, to reflect the scales of variability in processes um, that we see in mountains. And so it's still really an ongoing process and the challenge is always saying essential for what are we talking about science or, or, or policy but the idea is just to i think try to develop this interdisciplinary consensus about where should we be investing our resources and coming to some compromise in terms of saying we want to measure absolutely everything versus we want to um we want to, we have to restrict that and just provide some key indicators and it's kind of complex because mountains are of course um rather complex environments themselves, but we, we're trying to find a little bit this balance in terms of um, yeah, resources and, and information content, I suppose. Happy to discuss further. Thank you very much. Um, we will have time, hopefully, at the end of the session, once we listen to the other presentations, to um, inspire uh, more questions and comments uh, as colleagues. Um, uh, are exposed more to the topic, I suppose, in, this, in the course of the session. Thank you very much, James. Um, uh, so do stay online uh, in case we do have questions for you towards the end of the session. Thank you. I should at this point also um, share with you some, some announcements, which I um, missed to share with you at the very beginning of the session. Apologies for that. I will remind you this, this, this session is being recorded, so please let us know if that is an issue for you. And um, we all the presentations and the recordings will be shared through the Eurogeo website at the end of the workshop as well. But feel free to contact us if, if there's anything we can help in accessing that information for you. Um, I should also point out that we do have an online contingent uh, joining us uh, virtually. So welcome to all of you in the virtual world as well. Thank you for being with us. And on that note, I just wanted to very quickly check if there are any questions or comments coming from the online participants, not at this point. Thank you. And um, I will go through a couple more announcements at the end of the session. So on that note, we should move on to our next uh, presenter. Uh, this is Alexander Jakob here who will talk to us and present on the Alpine Drought Observatory, how to organize and share data in a cross-national mountain region following the fair data principles. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Great. Uh, thank you for this introduction, Caroline. Um, yeah, I will speak about the Alpine Drought Observatory, which is a project that we have had here in uh, URAC the last three years. We just finished this uh, in the beginning of the year. I'm still waiting for my slides. There they here they are. So, so 
مطلوب من الفلوس Somehow there are some slides missing in the beginning of my presentation, but uh, it's okay. I can guess I can start. I'm just checking this is not uh, exactly how I uploaded, but I, whatever, something went wrong there. Um, anyways, uh, there, there was some introductory slide to the project that is missing, but it's okay. Uh, the project uh, had basically two main objectives. Uh, number one was to create a, uh, a platform to to make uh, information about uh, drought accessible for everyone and the other objective was to develop together with stakeholders also policies uh, policies and, and guidelines for people who, who deal with uh, water management uh, in the in general in the hydrological sector in different states the, the project uh, was a international project uh, across borders for uh, it was funded through the interreg alpine space and um, apart from yeah, building this platform, there was a huge component also developing these guidelines. My colleagues here in the back, for example, are working on this and others as well. Today, I will talk more on the technical aspect um, about the platform itself and how we worked there in order to um, make it accessible and, and uh, work with it. So uh, droughts in the Alps, uh, is this actually um, a strange thing? Is this happening? I don't also know why some of the pictures are only half here, but something wrong here. Anyways, let's see how we get through this. <laughs> um, there are definitely uh, different uh, notions of, of drought here, even though we're in general a water-rich uh, region, still there are issues of distribution of water availability in, in different seasons. And in recent history, we had mostly kind of winter drought events where in, in early season after the, the, the winter, January, February, March, basically we had drought events. Here are some notions of this coming through newspapers, which is one way where you can find people reporting this. Uh, the question is, can we find these events that people speak about also in our data? Are we somehow able to detect them? That's somewhat what we set out to do in this uh, work. The concept in order to achieve this scientifically, first of all, what is actually kind of information, the indicators that we can use. This was the first part of the project in the beginning to make an analysis of all the different indices, SPI, SPEI, and many others to check what is actually useful. The next thing is what kind of data do we need to produce these indicators uh, in order to do that? And do we have the information also for long enough time frame that we can have some kind of notion of the climatological things that are ongoing here? So, you know, for this, you need decades of data is not enough to just have data from the most recent satellite missions that give you five, six years of data, you need to have long time series, which we saw also is an issue in availability from the presentation from James before. Uh, in, in the end, we managed to um, give a reference time frame from the 80s about 2020 more or less uh, as, as uh, our reference period. And uh, basically drought events can be then seen as anomalies and deviations from the normal behavior along this reference period. Uh, we had different types of uh, um, variables here, meteorological uh, derived ones from climate um, meteorological data, satellite driven data from hydrological parameters, other sources of information like just impacts, reports and newspapers and scientific articles and so on, on what has been happening with drowns. Also analysis of vulnerabilities, areas and places where uh, that are particular um, under stress when, when drought occurs. Finally, uh, production of all the data is the next step. So how can we do this in a way that this is sustainable and, and manageable by us also after the project? So we can at least happily announce that for the first year, more or less, we managed to keep this alive already. Uh, so the other portal is actually still online and available. We have built strongly on open source uh, there. Uh, it's uh, operational and uh, as automated as possible. And we try also to be as timely as possible with the updates there. And finally, this all is only good if we disseminate this to other people, make it accessible, make it understandable, follow something like the fair data principle. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And finally, then also actionable so that somebody can actually do something with this and make some useful decisions. Okay, I think it will be, there are some strange things happening here. I think I'm, I don't know if I can upload my slides again because there are definitely things missing here. Um, I have them on my stick, so.
Uh, I will try to do it that way and move my own slides and the ones here forward. Um, yeah, I saw it also before. Before I thought it was just an issue with an export, but it seems to be some general project. Sorry for this interruption. Hmm? Yeah, but I, I have them here as well. I mean, they work on my computer. It's, I don't know why, why they're wrong um, there. Okay, so I... I was behind. Okay, so generally the other platform that you don't see here has basically a, a number of key components. Uh, one is the, the, the data component that is really all the information that we have collected about this. Um, then we have uh, um, all the data set as the drought indices and information from different in situ stations, hydrological stations, and all the uh, um, reliable auxiliary data like impact assessment, vulnerability maps, and so on. Another thing is all the metadata describing all of this, all the concepts that you need uh, in order to um, to um, deal with the, the data um, that really describes and makes them findable. That's the, the F part of, of the FAIR principles. Uh, this comes together with the detailed descriptions of all the data sets like fact sheets that describe in a lot of detail about all of the um, data that is contained there. Um, also things like uh, making the data sets citable. So give them a DOI, digital object identifier so that people can reference exactly to which kind of data that they have used um, is, is quite important, uh, especially in the scientific world. Another thing is the production uh, of the data sets through an automized way. And finally, also uh, the, the accessibility through standardized interfaces so that people can get in there. Um, in order to achieve this, we had a, a longer phase also of uh, talking to, to stakeholders and interest parties in the project. Actually, we had a huge uh, effort on collecting information from all the different countries. So in the, in the project, we had representatives from all the Alpine countries. And in each country, we organized throughout the run of the project, three national workshops. So about, I think, 24 workshops in total, where we really spoke to stakeholders and the people and their interest and what kind of information they use, how they use it, uh, what they want. And, and then in the later workshops, we presented them some of our solutions in terms of exchange for this. We did then some kind of profiling of different types of users that, that you might find there. Um, and these people are not all hydrological experts or data scientists. So we really tried to think about the policy makers, uh, the different people from authorities, local, regional uh, authorities, the scientists, of course, are also one user group, advisors in agriculture, other um, domains that are related to that need water as a consumer, basically, um, just private persons who read the newspaper and want to get some more information about this, uh, journalists who want to, to write these newspaper articles, all of these were considered um, there. Then, um, based on this, we, we defined a whole web design. And uh, finally, then uh, we also made sure that when we implement everything, it's available open source. So all the components that we have uh, developed in the project, including the website itself, the web portal, all of this has been developed in open source. Um, and uh, is uh, shared through our GitLab resources here that includes also documentation on how to deal with this. Then finally, we have a slide that works now. You see the same as I do. That's at least something. <laughs> so uh, this is a slide that uh, talks about our production environment. So here we tried to follow a, a pipeline-based approach, which is called CICD, Continuous Integration and Continuous Development, which allows us uh, that uh, we develop the code bases together with the people in the project. A huge effort here was also that we shared our compute resources, our software infrastructure, the Git, and so on with all the participating partners in the project so that we could all develop the, the software components together, also in a way that, for example, someone who, who is more uh, an expert in a specific part of developing an algorithm for, for calculating the SPI or SPI or things like this, doesn't have to know all the things of how to run this in an operational scalable fashion, basically, so that they could do a kind of handover, give their codes that, that they created for producing the data, and then we can uh, bring that into these pipelines to, to run them in an operational way. Um, this allowed us uh, also 
then to update continuously uh, all the different bits and pieces that, that go into this uh, pipeline. Uh, here we can actually see uh, a whole of the pipeline. So this involves things like download the climate data for everyone so that not every individual downloads the climate data by themselves, but we, we create a, uh, the input data and share them among others. Uh, so there's an operational component here. Uh, do I have a pointer? No. Uh, there, there's an operational component here like the, the downloads all the data, which is then shared among different people who do processes for calculating the indices based for snow data, which have been, for example, developed by some now Geosphere Austria. We have other people who have been working on the drought indices, which came from the Slovenian Environmental uh, Ministry. Um, and uh, then we in Europe, for example, have been working on Earth observation derived uh, indices like the VHI and the VCI. And all of them get produced automatically in the end and feed into the databases of the portal. Uh, and, and from there, they're accessible in different ways to visualize them, for example. Um, this pipeline design has also the advantage that you can see when things go wrong. Sometimes the, the, you, the data that you download is not complete, it's corrupt something. When, when you run all of these things, you can have some kind of quality assurance to see if all the processing has been finalized correctly or things are missing in there. This uh, can also be then can linked to automatically to the fact that once things are missing, we get automatically emails sent to some of the people here who, who maintain this uh, to check what's going wrong. What we realized when doing this is when you build such a system and you think it's running automatically forever, it's never the case because whenever we had it running, we realized that basically the week after one of the input sources that we used changed their API or changed something in their data organization. And then you need to update your code again so that the data is automatically pulled in the correct way. And we see that this is now also part of the maintenance of this platform. Uh, even stupid things like yeah, downloading the satellite imagery or some some data from hydrological stations change all the time. So there's not like something constant. It's really a moving target to get access to these different databases. And, and we struggle with this basically every other week that something in all of these different components that are part of the pipeline changes. And then we need to update our code base there as well. And for that, again, it's also nice to have this all in open source because this allows us to also get help from others. For example, the part that some has developed now Geosphere, uh, even after the project finished, uh, since this is all open source, they could also integrate modifications from their part of their code base and help us to bring this back into the operational pipeline. So that really shows uh, a nice advantage of open source is also that you can put the whole problems on, on more shoulders and have more support because you're not the only one that can fix the problems once they occur, basically. Here you can see a list of uh, different uh, parts of information that we have a little bit grouped by uh, what they cover. So uh, parts of the atmosphere, things like precipitation anomalies, and then derived from this also the standardized precipitation index. Uh, soil related parameters like the soil moisture and the evapotranspiration. Vegetation health, uh, things like the normalized vegetation, uh, vegetation index or the vegetation health index, and then also things that are more related to the water, the groundwater. Groundwater, we do not really have a lot, but at least uh, the top part uh, and on also snow, like the standard snowpack index, SSPI and hydrological indexes coming there. Um, now we go slowly over to standardization and making these things accessible. So one standard that we work for uh, a lot here in Europe together with many partners internationally also is OpenEO, a processing standardization framework. I would say that has a list of predefined uh, processors uh, and also a data model that that is following the spatial temporal asset catalog stack in order to share this data. This is more for expert users kind of access. So people who really want to work with the with the, all the data in, in, in the best possible form. Um, okay, now I don't know how many slides, uh, slides I have jumped again here. Let me see where, where we are. So there, there are also other um, sources uh, um, apart from the OpenEO in um, based access. We have also some of the OGC standards like the WCS for the web coverage service to download the data for people who not want to change anything, just want to download the data. Um, that is basically uh, what is appearing here. 
Here you were supposed to see something similar to what James presented, a list of all the hydrological stations for uh, the difference to what James presented is that we not only created a catalog of all the available stations, we also try to get all the data for these stations in the Alps uh, and also work on harmonizing these time series in a, in a standardized uh, quality uh, controlled way so that they all uh, uh, cleaned up, uh, removed outliers, uh, bias corrected, and, and all these kind of things, so that all the time series from the different stations are consistent. Uh, this uh, database uh, is also online available. There's also an, an API that allows you to access this through our environmental data, data portal. This is something which is uh, very difficult to keep automatically up to date, as basically not only every different country, but more or less every different state, every different region, every different <laughs> canton has basically a different way of how they provide APIs to get them. Some of them don't even provide APIs. In some cases, we got this data by writing emails to people who sent us back CSV files of, of the station data, basically. So there is no online accessible autom uh, automatic way, which means you cannot really uh, feed into these systems uh, consistently. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this database, at least until the end of the project, we we, uh, we, we have it uh, now for our region. We try to keep it up to date also. Um, maybe something to discuss also with you guys, if we can have some more concrete effort on, on keeping this alive for at least the European Alps to do this on a global level. I don't even want to imagine how much work that is right now, but you need to start somewhere. Um, apart from the... Uh, station data we collected also uh, or we enhanced uh, already existing database on, on the impacts of drought so this is basically just reports coming from scientific publication national reports and newspapers and so on have been classified into different sets of uh, drought events and the impact that they have which is a textual uh, type of information that has been developed by the university of freiburg they have done this uh, initially for the european drought observatory and for the alpine drought observatory we try to update this during the project this is another one of the things which is a lot of manual labor which is not easily automizable so this is another effort to collect continuously this impact basically you would need to have someone responsible in every different country to do this kind of work because um, here you need to also take into account the different languages uh, you need to have an expert in the local language of the region that is able to read all the newspaper web uh, presence and all the things and uh, translate them and bring them into such a database again it's still uh, quite interesting some of uh, the people who worked on this they took even out texts that come from the 1500s or so from drought events so there's a really long of course the the number of events and as they're described they increase dramatically with the digital age uh, but yeah uh, the next thing is metadata this is uh, again very important so first of all we put all the data available through our own platform the environmental data platform but since not many people are aware of it it is quite important that you adhere to international standards so that everyone can actually find this uh, to this domain we uh, made sure that our metadata is compliant with ISO standards and, and upcoming emerging standards like stack this allows for example that our data is findable on geos again here we're supposed to see that you actually can find it on geos you have my take my words on that now but uh, it is actually uh um, dynamically linked so when we update then the next day at least geos is harvesting from our catalogs and the, the data sets appear there in the latest version and what i mentioned already the, the doi the digital object identifier uh, that exists for every data set uh, and comes also with fact sheets and additional information uh, on how, how these data sets have been created then here uh, is the online platform this is supposed to be the interface for the non-expert user where he can just go see in nice colors uh, a rough overview of the regions uh, this overview exists both uh, on the level of uh, political boundaries like the nuts regions for example you can have this in the nuts two or nuts three level or it also exists on the level of hydrological basins uh, based on how we create our database with the raster data in the background we can then make aggregations on any kind of polygon and then we can recreate these indices uh, and aggregate them over any kind of boundary that someone wants to have. Um, yeah, I think uh, maybe here you can see for the stations that I mentioned already, uh, we have 
the whole time series in there so that people can have a look at this together with some standard parameters that give some information about the statistics of, of this data set, the time series, the spread, and so on, uh, that you can really go back there. This is for all the thousand something stations available. And now to close the point of the beginning of this presentation, can we actually detect this reported impacts? To this end, we can create a small analytical workflow, which has been designed by Peter. He is also one of the main developers here. So in this case, we looked into the standardized snowpack index. Uh, we filter only the winter months out as we, all of the um, uh, events that are described in these articles were winter drought events. Then aggregate uh, the monthly values and, and look at the, the mean value over the, the long time period that I mentioned in the beginning. And then you can really see in this uh, graphs here, this, uh, um, that we can actually see some of these events here. For example, the, the drought event in winter 2017, we have a extreme uh, low value of the standardized snowpacks index. Uh, in the case of 2022 and 2023, we can also see that we are in general below the average here, whereas in other years, uh, we, we are above that. So at least to some degree, yes, we can see some of this information also in the actual data that we have in the database. And that's something that we are quite happy about. This allows now researchers to use this and make more in-depth analysis for different regions, different environments. And we had actually some very nice collaborations. There already people actively started to use this. Uh, there has been published a paper together with the German Aerospace Agency who has been working on looking at uh, the duration of snow cumber days and, and how this is linked to different um, drought events. Um, based from satellite data. The data that is in here is not only used by us, but apart from making it findable, it's also openly accessible to others. This data is uh, continuously harvested also by other national drought observatories. Uh, uh, at this moment, uh, we have uh, the Swiss portal trockenheit.ch or drought.ch, which we are in contact with, and also in Austria, the new ESA-based platform, the GTIF platform is directly linked to this since we uh, make the data online available and uh, we are also in exchange with the, the JRC and the European and Global Drought Observatory operators where um, where we where we have offered basically that this could be a kind of template software architecture that can be used for regional drought observatories. They have a running project there right now, Edora, which is the, the network of European drought observatories uh, where we where we also have some exchange there. With this I um, come to an end. Um, oh, this was the conclusion again, but I think it's fine. Um, no, there was a thank you. Thank you, everyone, for <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think this was the most funny presentation I had to give. I couldn't share you half of the things that I have here. I hope you could still follow somewhat to this, and uh, I will make sure that the online version that we put into the final program will be the complete <laughs> slides. <laughs> Yeah, the, the main URL, if you want to have a look at this, is ado.urac.edu. So this you can access. Uh, I can write it also here on the board. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much. We'll get to the bottom of these gremlins. <laughs> For some reason, we've had this problem all day with the slides. Thank you. Um, at this point, can I ask for any questions or comments from the audience? Also, for those that are online who would like to briefly comment before we move on. Otherwise, we do have the URL here. Thank you for, for sharing that, Alex. And we will, as part of the recording and resources for this session, we'll make sure we have the, the slides available for that. And we will come back to the lessons learned, particularly on the issue of sustaining beyond projects. I think this is a common thing that we've been hearing from a lot of presentations. Um, and this is something where I feel EuroGeo and Geo in particular need to be in a position to to broker and facilitate that process going forward because a lot of work and and intelligence and and uh, resources have gone into developing some very very useful resources indeed great on that note i would like to now invite our next speaker And I just get to my glasses here to make sure I have the right one. Yes, so we have Valentina Dalosso from uh, OIREC Research as well, 
who will be presenting the Climate Impetus, which is a EU-funded project under uh, Horizon um, 2020. And this is a project uh, funding under the um, Green Deal, indeed. Um, and MRI is very uh, glad to be collaborating as well as part of this project. And Valentina will be talking to us about the long-term availability of data and engagement of stakeholders through the development of Resilience Knowledge Booster for a mountain case study. Thank you very much, Valentina. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good Good afternoon, everyone, also from my side. So uh, yes, I'm happy to be here to present what we are doing in this uh, uh, project. Uh, here you see we are uh, quite a big group of, of colleagues in, in Iraq. Uh, in this project, we are coordinating the mountain uh, demo site. And we are, yes, co colleagues of different institutes uh, of, of URAC. Uh, so what is, sorry, uh, what is Impetus? So uh, as Carolina said, uh, Impetus uh, is, is financed under the Horizon 2020 program. Uh, it's a quite big project. There are 32 partners uh, involved in uh, that, that are placed in different countries in, in Europe. It is one of the projects that was fi financed under the, the Green Deal on the adaptation uh, to, to climate change topic. And uh, the main ob objective is to turn the climate commitments into tangible and uh, urgent actions to enhance the uh, climate resilience of different communities. We are more or less at half of, of the project. It started in October 2021 and will end in uh, September 2025. Um, so all the um, activities, uh, the, the implementation activities are um, are developed within seven uh, demo uh, demo sites uh, that are uh, all around Europe and they were chosen to represent different bio, biogeographical regions. And so and today I am going to, to, to present some activities that we are developing for the Valle de Laghi that uh, is, uh, let's say, the mountain demo site and it's located in the in the Alps. Um, so still about the project, uh, as I said, um, the project goal is to help uh, this demo site to develop their own uh, best adaptation pathway. Uh, so to go to the climate ne neutrality. And uh, it's uh, doing that by, uh, let's say, applying different uh, approaches. So by testing uh, technological and network-based solutions, for example, engaging uh, a lot with the local communities, uh, different kind of, of stakeholders, policymakers, businesses, uh, citizens, uh, in in, in co-creation processes, so to co-create the knowledge, but also to have some impact on, on policies and also to uh, help uh, um, stakeholders to develop innovative approaches. Um, the project would also like to encourage the ownership of this kind of adaptation measures by local stakeholders, so um, working closely with, uh, with the local uh, communities and to then also ensure that uh, all these uh, developed uh, measures and tools will uh, will then be used by by the stakeholders and um uh, what is uh, let's say the in the heart of 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 uh, the project uh, are these uh, resilience knowledge boosters uh, and uh, that i will explain um Later on, but uh, uh, these hubs uh, are, let's say, um, are a space where gathering knowledge uh, about different uh, different sectors, so uh, scientific, uh, technical, social, but also uh, policy um, related uh, issues, and uh, sharing this knowledge at different levels. So in the local demo site, in the in the regions that were the demo sites are located, but also, uh, let's say, at the broader level in uh, uh, in Europe, uh, for example, and in uh, similar uh, bio biogeographical regions. And this RKB, because it will be an RKB for uh, for each of, of the demo sites, uh, they, in the end, will be interconnected among each other, and they will also be available uh, and accessible to uh, act, uh, active communities and organizations across Europe 
to also, um, let's say, share data information, but uh, also uh, lessons learned during the, uh, the project. Uh, so what is uh, this uh, Resilience Knowledge Booster? Um, here you can see a nice infographic that was developed by the, our um, partner on communication and, and dissemination. Um, so it's a space um, that is digital, but would also be, uh, let's say, a human, uh, would also have a human dimension. So it's a space where uh, people, different stakeholders, uh, can interact among them and then can also um, share knowledge, data, and can access also data. So uh, the idea is to uh, combine the um, experience and the knowledge that uh, come from, uh, comes from uh, people that are working on uh, climate adaptation topics, but that people also people that are working and living in in areas that are experiencing different climate change impacts. The idea is to combine this knowledge with the scientific and data-related knowledge. So different kind of data from satellite data to climate projections uh, to other, uh, let's say, data set that can be also quantitative, qualitative. Uh, um, there will be also some tools that are applied uh, artificial intelligence or other kind of, let's say, um, technologies. And the idea is to um, let people interact with this kind of data, access the data, but also have a place where to discuss about topics that are uh, of um, interest. And um, this will be done, as I said, for the different demo sites. Uh, so different, let's say, climate, uh, climate events, uh, climate uh, risk, and uh, also yeah, different kind of solutions. Uh, and then all the, all the RKB will be connected and will, uh, let's say, will um, create a sort of big space uh, where to to uh, yeah to share knowledge about um, adaptation to climate change, and on YouTube you can also find a nice video. I put in the presentation the the link, but you can also yeah go on YouTube and uh, looking for climate impetus, and you will find um, yeah a nice video on on this concept. Um, so uh, what we are doing in the Valle dei Laghi, as, as I said, the Valle dei Laghi is uh, sorry is the um, one of the, the seven demo sites um, was chosen to represent uh, the the mountain uh, the mountainous regions um, so we here we are in the province of trento in the alps just a bit south uh, from from here from the province of bolzano and um, Valle de Laghi is uh, yeah, an alpine valley that is characterized by a lot of water. Water is the main element. There are a lot of lakes and rivers. And also the local economy is based on, um, uh, yes, on activities related to water. So agriculture but, and mainly uh, wine yards. Uh, then we, uh, we have um, hydropower generation so energy uh, energy production from from hydropower and tourism really uh, connected to mountains and uh, water uh, here uh, we as urac are uh, we are coordinating the activities uh, in the in the demo site and we are working uh, with different partners uh, we have the beam sarca that is a consortium uh, consortium of municipalities uh, of the valley uh, we have Mobi GIS, that is a small medium enterprise specialized in hydrogeological models and digital twin. And then we have uh, the Monte Research Initiative in supporting us in some activities. And Lobelia, that is a um, Spanish service provider on uh, remote sensing data and uh, climate projection. Um, so here we are, uh, let's say, we are dealing mainly with uh, the water scarcity issue because in the first year, in the, yeah, in the first year of activities, um, we, we didn't have before a focus on some specific, let's say, climate uh, um, problem issue, but then we, we realized that, yeah, the drought and the, and the water scarcity is... Uh, uh, is really the big the big issue, and so we we focus on um, on, on this for the different activities. 
so with what are uh, which are the adaptation solutions that we are working on for for this demo site um we have uh, um we would like to 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 develop a decision support system to allow the water resource management to be more sustainable and more integrated and to address the conflicting uh, usages of of water in particular in situation of of water scarcity uh, so now we are working on the on a digital twin that will be the, let's say the back end of of this uh, dss and uh, and uh, we are let's say validating it with uh, with the interested interested stakeholders. Uh, then we have a task about analysis of innovative insurance products uh, to limit the economic losses due to climate change impacts. And here we are interested to see how yeah the climate models and the cl climate indexes and uh, different kind of data can support insurance we have an an insurance uh, company as a server and we would like to uh, to understand how we can help um, insurance companies in, in general to um to taking into consideration uh the let's say the climate change impacts in their uh in their um work and in the way that they uh, evaluate the different uh and losses and how they develop their products. Um, then we have a um, task about activation of cultural heritage to improve community resilience to climate change. And here we are working on two sides, a tangible side. So we are speaking about um, historical buildings and how they can perform. Uh, um, in a say changing climate, so in from the climate and the energy point of view, and uh, from the intangible side, um, we are speaking about uh, perceptions and all the let's say implicit also behaviors that people are already um, applying to adapt to climate change and how they can be uh, activate uh, activated to uh, enhance the whole, uh, let's say, um, community resilience. Um, then we are also all working on the risk management and assessment to improve the practices, the, the current practices, and we are doing it applying uh, the impact chain, um, the impact chains uh, method that is developed within URAC um, by some of uh, our colleagues. And we are doing this in a participatory with a participatory approach, so through workshops, and we are applying uh, this uh, this method in two sectors that are also related to the other tasks. So in agriculture and on on agric the agricultural sector and on the built environment. Um, then we also have an activity, um, a task re related to the evaluation of altitudinal shift of crops as adaptation measure for, for vineyards. Um, here, unfortunately, the department that was mainly involved in, in this task left, uh, quit the project some months ago. Uh, but yeah, we are in the phase of uh, replacing this partner. And so hopefully we will uh, go on also with this, uh, with this activity and uh, that um, will uh, say uh, provide also some in situ data because uh, the idea was to uh, to place some sensors and some uh, yeah networks in different uh, one years in the, in one years at different altitudes to to then compare the data and uh, the and uh, analyze how this can be uh, an effective uh, adaptation measure so what sorry i have a problem with this <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what the RKB of Valle de Laghi will look like, we still don't know because we are now in the uh, in the middle of, let's say, the implementation activities and uh, also the partners that are in charge of developing this kind of, of tool of space are, um, are now discussing how would be the best, uh, let's say, um, uh, the best um, way to uh, to have all this kind of, of data together. But uh, what I can present to you today are the functionalities, the main functionalities that we are um, 
thinking about to have in our RKB and also the main users that we are, uh, let's say, uh, we would like to have then um, access and uh, interact in this, um, in this uh, space. So as main functionalities, there will be for sure a section on general uh, information on the demo site, uh, then a place as a document re repository for uh, our idea is to have every kind of document, reports, guidelines, et cetera, related to climate change adaptation, not only in the Valle dei Laghi, but in the, in the province of Trento, uh, in, the, in the region. Um, then um, the idea is also to have a calendar of events about climate change adaptation in the region, so as well to have, let's say, uh, a collection of events, past and future, uh, where interested people can um, can then have some information about the event and also maybe a link to to the registration uh, website or uh, more information to how to be involved. Um, we are uh, also thinking about a, a repository of, of information that we are um, that are like the outputs of the workshops that we are we are. Um, performing so all the documents all the reports uh, uh, that are produced uh, during our workshops will be then available and uh, maybe we can also connect with other let's say um, entities or institutions that are working on on the same topic in the in the region um, there will be for sure a climate projection uh, section with the scenarios probably maps where uh, users can navigate and see what, uh, yeah, what the climate projection uh, will be for, for different locations. Um, there will be a section about adaptation pathways. So as I said before, the idea is to have um, different pathways for each demo site and then uh, be able to select uh, the best adaptation pathways according to different variables. And these adaptation pathways will be composed by interventions, so by the, let's say, the combination of the adaptation solutions that I showed you before. And also here we are, of course, in the middle of uh, understanding how to uh, com compose these uh, uh, adaptation pathways, how to then uh, vi visualize them. And, uh, but these will be for sure a, a section of the RKB. And then there will be uh, a place uh, to link, um, to have a link to all the tools that are developed by uh, demo site partners. For example, in our case, this decision support system for water management will be like a standalone uh, tool, but we would like to uh, allow people that uh, will access the RKB uh, to then be connected also to, to, to this tool, as well as the impact chains, the guidelines that our colleagues are, uh, are now um, writing and will be published. And so we would like to, uh, to have the link to uh, all the, yeah, all these kind of, let's say, tools that are more specific for our demo site, but will be also interested for, hopefully for, for other um, regions. And as main users, yes. as main users, uh, we are mainly thinking about policy and decision makers. Uh, then, um, so authorities also different level, not only the, for the valley, let's say local, but also the province and the region, uh, regional level. And then managers for uh, of irrigation consortia, since we have a lot of activities related to agriculture and wine yards, uh, they are uh, already involved, uh, the irrigation consortia in different uh, tasks. So it would be nice that they, uh, if they, they can really use this, this kind of, uh, of tool. And then, of course, different uh, other kind of users like scientists, uh, citizens, or, or key community members. And uh, so in the end, conclusions. Um, here I try to, to follow some questions that <laughs> the organizer um, asked to us. Uh, so about accessibility and usability of data and information. 
I think that projects like Impetus uh, can be a big example and a good example also of for uh, the, the usability of, of data, but uh, let's say up to now, the development of this resilience knowledge booster seems very complex. And uh, hopefully at the end of the project, we can, we will see how we, uh, we could improve. And for sure, some improvement will be uh, only, uh, let's say, in uh, gathering pe people together, talking about uh, different kind of um, topics uh, related to climate change adaptation and allow them to access different kind of information. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, uh, this is uh, quite a um, yeah a big question, and uh, we are yeah trying to do our best to uh, to allow the to improve the accessibility of of data and uh, challenges and opportunities to integrate and apply data and information to have some impacts in scientific policy or other sector the, uh, within this project. Um, here, I think that us as, as partners should be really clever in understanding how uh, to make this tool really usable and accessible for the potential users. So the stakeholders that we uh, we identified as our main uh, main users, and um, as well for long term sustainability uh, of data and, and information. The idea of RKB is really to aim uh, to is really to provide this this uh, space. Uh, uh, to share data and knowledge, and also to uh, get people um, involved, so to have this network, and um, not only in in the in the region in the in the demo site, but also at um, for other communities uh, in, in in Europe. And here we are uh, talking about um, we are thinking about. Um, have some activities replicated in other mountainous regions, and so also to enlarge the uh, yeah the um, the communities and the 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 network. Um, that is also one of the aim uh, of of the project to have yeah replication sites. And uh, so yeah, about the sustainability plan of of the project, this is the idea to ensure. Uh, sustainability after the end of the project lifetime, and also, as I said, the way um, in which we are we are going to interconnect all these RKBs mm -hmm. and communities at, in different places and at different scale scales should be something that uh, will allow the yeah, the idea and the, this 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 tool to to survive after the end of the project. Um, thank you. So thank Valentina. you very much. Sorry, we're running out of time. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on. If we have the opportunity for any questions, uh, we'll allow that at the end of the last presenter. Um, but the last slide is very useful for us because we will refer to that as part of the um, uh, lessons learned for us to take forward. So in that... Um, uh, spirit, I would like to also invite Marta Galvano from ARPA, who will be talking to us about the experiences and lessons had from a EU-funded project, Pastor Up. And so far, it's been interesting to hear the various experiences had from projects that are still ongoing, who are looking to uh, reach their conclusion, versus those that are concluded and have um, some concrete uh, experiences and lessons to share. So I think your slides are up by now. Thank you very much. Close yours, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Carolina, for the introduction. I also would like to thank uh, thank you again, Carolina, and the organizers for this uh, uh, kind invitation. And I'm very happy to be here sharing our experience. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, because it, it is a PDF. I I don't see the okay. Yeah. Uh, 
I thought it would be better to have a PDF. <laughs> While we wait for the slides to come up, hopefully we'll have the chance to listen to our last speaker. Um, just a couple of um, announcements after this session. We will enter into a coffee break um, before the final segment later tonight. And in that period, uh, there is a possibility to join the e-posters. There is uh, already, um, you've probably seen them displayed uh, in the screens around the coffee uh, area. So please do take the chance to have a look at those. Um, there's also a possibility during Geo Week, which will take place in November in Cape Town. Um, for showcasing all of the projects and slides and videos that you have been presenting as part of the EuroGeo um, uh, booth. They are calling right now for uh, videos and inputs that can be showcased as part of that exhibition. So please do reach out to the organizers by this week if you have any materials that you would like to share. We've seen already links to videos and slides um, so take the opportunity to have those shared with our wider global audience as well. I think we are yeah. on business now. I hope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm, I'm terrified to, to yeah. click uh, to the next slide, <laughs> see if it works. Okay. Um, so uh, in building uh, my presentation, I thought it could be useful to directly refer to the to some of the uh, Eurogeo uh, goals, so, so such as, for example, the synergies across the national and the European projects or approaches to face uh, climate change crisis. And, uh, and maybe the, the, the one that is mostly related to this presentation and also to the previous one, uh, the interface between uh, uh, science and policy. So you will find some of these uh, symbols uh, throughout the presentation. I hope this is useful. Uh, okay, oops. Okay, so um, Pastor Alpe was a, a project co-founded by uh, the European Commission through the LIFE program, in particular the Climate Change uh, Adaptation Sub-Program. It has just uh, ended last March, and uh, it, it was a very nice uh, six years uh, long uh, journey. 
Uh, so uh, I would like to actually to start from the happy ending uh, of the story because we uh, just hosted the uh, pastoral final conference uh, uh, last March uh, in uh, Osa Valley. And uh, we are very happy that uh, we were able to bring together such a diverse group of people in the audience. Uh, we had a lot of interest uh, on the project and um, nice interactions between scientists and non-scientists and also uh, inspiring uh, uh, conversation between our policymakers and, and our uh, keynote speakers. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, uh, nice uh, attendance was due to the fact that many people follow the project during the six years, but also because uh, uh, we know from uh, scientific data that uh, permanent grassland have a, a high importance uh, in uh, uh, European uh, agriculture and cover uh, a great percentage uh, of the uh, total European agricultural area. And you can see that uh, uh, especially in, uh, in Asta Valley, but in general in, in the Alps, uh, uh, this percentage could also cover uh, 90, 95% of the total agricultural area. Uh, despite this uh, importance, we also know that uh, uh, mountain grasslands uh, are vulnerable to climate change uh, impacts, but uh, from uh, an environmental and uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, point of view. And uh, so the main goal of the project was to analyze the vulnerability of uh, uh, mountain pastures to climate change and also to propose uh, um, adaptation measures uh, and the policy recommendation. Uh, the most of the scientific uh, activities uh, were focused on uh, uh, two study areas, uh, one uh, in France, uh, in the Parc des Ecrans, and uh, one in Italy, in the National Park uh, of uh, uh, Grand Paradiso. Okay, so uh, being uh, um, a life project, as you know, one core activity was the stakeholder engagement. And uh, I have to be honest here, when writing the proposal as a scientist, uh, I had a confused idea on what we should have done and how we should have done it. And I think that this is because as scientists, uh, uh, we don't have actually a formal education on uh, stakeholder engagement. And often uh, we focus on producing the data, um, presenting the project goals and results to our stakeholders, but we don't really engage with them. And so oh, with, uh, with Pastor Alp, uh, I've learned uh, to, uh, to try to better understand those, to better appreciate uh, the policy cycle and uh, uh, the complexity of, uh, of policy implementation, trying to better connect uh, with uh, the policymakers, uh, trying to use uh, um, a more collaborative approach, using empathy, and trying to understand uh, the need of uh, uh, the policymakers. And so, to be able to produce actionable insights that uh, can really be uh, can really enter the the policy process. So, uh, I brought here some examples of these uh, uh, interconnections. One of the um, main goal of the Pastoral Alpe project was to test uh, an approach to classify uh, the pastoral types in the two study areas so using a remote sensing and a, a machine learning approach, and then to, um, to verify the method using a field service uh, in, in the study areas. I don't enter the, the details here because I, I didn't uh, uh, develop the method, but you can see here that we obtain a very good uh, uh, classification accuracy. And when we show this uh, to our uh, policymakers, uh, we knew that we they they actually needed a better uh, classification, a better information on uh, the pastoral resources uh, at uh, uh, the regional level. So they actually asked uh, us to produce uh, the same, so to extend the pastoral mapping for the entire Aosta Valley region. And uh, this is an example of information we produce, for example, this pastoral productivity map, but we also produce a map for uh, the presence of, uh, 
of the pastors. And uh, this was very useful for them because they, <clears throat> uh, they were able to have a new uh, register for pastor resource and also to uh, directly adopt these results uh, to implement uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the agricultural policy at the regional level. Another example uh, is uh, this uh, tool uh, that we develop uh, uh, under the request of uh, uh, the uh, agricultural department uh, uh, of Osta Valley uh, and that is related to the irrigation water requirements uh, of, uh, um, of meadow and pastures. So we developed this, uh, um, this tool based on the pasture alp results and this is uh, useful for uh, the regional administration to better plan the water resource use, uh, especially to face uh, the more and more frequent uh, drought events. But the map could be uh, updated yearly, so uh, they, they became uh, um, exactly an operational tool to plan uh, some of the uh, regional policies. Uh, finally, uh, another uh, goal of the Pasteur Alp was uh, to develop together with uh, uh, local uh, expert uh, adaptation measures and uh, uh, policy recommendation for agropastoral system that uh, were uh, viable uh, for the local communities. Uh, and, uh, and some of these uh, uh, recommendations, some of these uh, measures, uh, were uh, directly adopted uh, in one of the official regional documents that is the uh, regional uh, uh, climate change adaptation plan. So um, in synthesis, uh, I think that um, directly engaging uh, our policy makers uh, at the beginning of the project was really useful to ensure uh, the legacy of the project results. Uh, for example, uh, for the agricultural departments uh, of uh, Osta Valley, many of these results uh, um, are indeed useful for the implementation of the uh, regional uh, policies. And uh, for example, to improve uh, the um, cap measures, uh, uh, the cap payments measures uh, um, with the regional specifications, they now have uh, a more precise land use and pasture registry, and uh, they, uh, they were able to develop uh, uh, better uh, pasture plans. And uh, finally, they also had the opportunity to have uh, meetings uh, with uh, uh, the Directorate General of Agriculture and Environment of the European Commission, and also with uh, the National Authority for Payments uh, um, uh, in Agriculture to highlight the current limitation of the um, uh, adopt adoption application of uh, high level uh, uh, policy in agriculture to uh, local mountain uh, realities. And uh, uh, also thanks to these uh, meetings we had with the, the Director General, we, uh, the, the project captured uh, some attention. And so we were encouraged uh, to uh, to write uh, a joint uh, position paper um, that was prepared by nine uh, life working in the mountains uh, to highlight uh, some of the uh, pastoral outcomes, but also to um, highlight the critical issues related to the um, very different level of European, national, and uh, uh, local perspective on uh, uh, mountain agriculture. And also uh, to highlight some uh, uh, suggestions to try to reconcile uh, these uh, different perspectives. So I come first to my conclusion. And uh, what, uh, what I've learned from, from Pastor Alp uh, is uh, uh, the importance of a better understanding of the stakeholder perspectives uh, to be able to, um, uh, to actually produce 
viable and, uh, and useful results to be included in the policy cycle. And also the, important of, the importance of a bidirectional process in which as a scientist, we can, could actually learn uh, the um, complexity of this uh, process. And uh, I think that uh, um, we were also lucky uh, to meet uh, um, people that were very committed and uh, responsive. And I think that it was also because uh, the agro-pastoral system uh, is really uh, a crucial um, part of the mountain community. And, uh, and then I think that um, we also learned that uh, as mountain community, we still need to stress the importance of uh, mountain uh, agriculture peculiarities uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, better uh, adopt the higher level uh, European or national policies uh, into the local uh, reality. And, uh, and finally, um, has, as uh, it, is, it has uh, probably been, been also highlighted in the Valentina presentation, I think that it's very important to focus on results that could become operational tool and, uh, and so ensure the long-term sustainability of the whole project uh, investments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, any pressing questions for Marta while she's still with us here at the front? Um, just a very brief comment on my side. I was actually at the final conference. Uh, I was very glad to see how the project came together. And I was indeed actually very impressed by the audience who were largely policymakers and people from the region. I hardly saw too many scientists. And uh, in fact, the level of interest that this project had at that particular level was amazing. So um, I guess the, the lesson learned for that continuous engagement right from the start with those stakeholders is proof of the impact it, it can have and, and it can yield very good results at the end. So thank you for sharing that experience. Any questions online perhaps? Any comments? A very quiet online audience. Very good. Um, any final comments from anyone regarding any of the presentations that we've heard here today? Mark, please. Carolina, you mentioned it already. Um, it's about sustainability of services. And we even had a discussion over lunch break on that. Yes. Because um, we know, I mean, even from Aero, we I think we guaranteed three years after the end of the project to continue the service, which is already in a way exceptional on our own costs. Um, you might have similar problems here. I think this is the crucial part. So, um, and and we know that is also a bit um, due to due to the financing. So we get money for research projects and maybe pilot services, um, and then it's expected that the market solves the issue and someone is paying for it, and this doesn't work. And it's a pity that we are developing so nice services which are already operational and we are not able to continue them. So I think this is really a central issue for all these nice services, helping adaptation and um, um, monitoring mm -hmm. and managing risks. Very good to emphasize that point. I fully agree. And this has been underscored through all of the presentations presented today. And this is certainly something that needs to be highlighted as we make a position on what is it that GEO uh, can do and should do, perhaps to facilitate this. And um, we also see it as a responsibility from GEO Mountains to offer that conduit or, or advocacy for, for this as well. We, we try our best to give a mountains lens to all of these um, issues um, and we draw on the experiences and concrete examples from projects such as those presented today to build that case. So I'm very extremely grateful for the, all the inputs that have been shared today and underscore your point as well. Any final comments? I guess not at <laughs> this point in time. Any final comments from the presenters? Perhaps they, they, something that they thought of as they were concluding their presentations. Antonello, yes, please. Can I just say Antonello is the uh, instigator or, or grandfather <laughs> of our GEO Mountains. I, I, yeah. We owe a lot to your advocacy and efforts in GEO to have mountains showcase in GEO, so thanks. And then yeah, you did an excellent job in, in making it living 
Um, mm -hmm. One comment is that a few years ago, there was a call, a EU call, uh, on on um, action uh, to um, for mountains. Uh, the call had only one proposal, which was not accepted because it was uh, not very perfect, let me say. Uh, that was a pity, and, and then uh, the Commission decided not to, to issue again the call. So I think it would be very important to have again uh, a call on, on, uh, on, on mountains as an exploratory action. Uh, and this time, um, it should be managed by the community, so by ourselves, uh, in, in a different way. Perfect, yes. I, I was very much part of that process, and we were all disappointed. There were many deficiencies as to how that project was put forward. Um, and being the only one presented to the only call made on mountains and not get funded says a lot about the deficiencies that we did not meet, and I fully agree with you. And we need um, a critical mass once again to, to build on that and make that case and advocacy. And we have many colleagues here from the European Commission here who can hopefully help us also in, in meet that uh, expectation in future because it's much needed and we are running out of time. I think mountains are certainly one context that is calling for an urgent action, urgent, uh, especially in terms of adaptation, we are not in a position to fall back and, and wait for opportunities to come. We need to be proactive in making those opportunities happen for us. Okay, perfect. On that note, I would like to give you a chance to grab a coffee before the next segment. So apologies for the, all the technical issues. We'll deal with the gremlins in a separate uh, opportunity. But for now, thank you all very much for your attention and participation here. As I said, all of the resources and presentations will be made available to you. And thanks for all those of you online. Thanks, James, for sticking with us. And uh, um, yes, please do reach out if we can help and uh, do contact us for any assistance or ideas you might like to put forward. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.